It's now my pleasure to introduce our second panelist, Dr. Samuel Stratton. He is an adjunct professor of community health sciences here at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health and a senior program analyst at the Orange County California Healthcare Agency. He has field public health program experience at the US-Mexico border and in Central America. His general research interests include emergency public health and disasters. He's currently researching access to emergency medical care by undocumented residents and the association of near fatal immersion and drowning accidents among recent immigrants in Southern California. Dr. Stratton was active with the previous governor's California Border Health Commission and maintains active interest in the US-Mexico border by teaching on this topic here at UCLA FSPH. Additionally, Dr. Stratton is editor-in-chief for the journal Pre-Hospital and Disaster Medicine and serves on the board of directors of the World Association for Disaster and Emergency Medicine. He received his MD from the University of New Mexico and his MPH from the Fielding School of Public Health. He's a board-certified emergency medicine and internal medicine doctor. Let's welcome Dr. Stratton. While we're, <clears throat> while we're queuing up my slides, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, and um, uh, some of my former students I see in the audience, so uh, I hope not to disappoint them for sure. Um, so that's me. And um, the students that are in the audience that uh, have had classes under me, uh, realize that when I start a class, I want everyone to know what my biases are. These are some of my main background or things I'm doing now. The important thing is, is that my entire life has been spent in the public sector. I've never really uh, operated as a, a physician or in public health in a private uh, setting. So obviously I have that bias. The US-Mexico border is a complex, if you will, uh, entity. The uh, border, as you see here, is, uh, uh, winds along uh, desert territory, goes along the Rio Grande, as we call it in the United States. Uh, there are a number of sectors in the border, and the sector that I am most familiar with, actually, is the El Paso sector, which currently is, uh, right now, the most active sector. And as uh, said in my introduction, I have uh, worked with the California Border Health Commission primarily on public health issues and mainly on flu outbreaks and TB and things like that. And some of you may know Steve Waterman, who's at the uh, uh, quarantine station in San Diego, a graduate of UCLA. Um, I've worked with him in the past and others uh, in that area, but primarily El Paso and uh, that sector. I bring that up because if you look at uh, uh, Nogales and compare it to Tijuana, you're talking about two different worlds, and El Paso is a different world, really, even than, uh, let's say, Brownsville or some of the other areas. So this is a very, very complex, if you will, animal that we address when we talk about the border. It was formed under conflict. The border was formed by, if I can be so bold as to say, aggression by uh, the United States. It was part of the United States expansion. Uh, including Texas is really part of the United States, the Scotch-Irish that had gone in there in 1836, and um, in the Battle of San Jacinto, uh, were able to defeat Mexico and annexed, uh, made the Republic of Texas, which was quickly annexed into the United States. 1848, the U.S.-Mexico War occurred, uh, primarily fought in California. Los Angeles is one of the main areas where some of the battles were taken. And if you drive up uh, the uh, Interstate 15 or Interstate 5, you can see some of these old forts, Fort Tejon and all of these uh, revert back to that era. In my class, I teach a class on U.S.-Mexico border health. And in my class, I point out to the students that what happened in 1849 that made all of this area incredibly uh, uh, much more valuable. 1849 was the California Gold Rush. And uh, so this uh, war that uh, was fought by the United States was very well timed for the US, very badly timed for Mexico. And then in 1853, uh, the Gadsden Purchase was uh, 
uh, completed between Mexico and the U.S. This was southern Arizona, part of New Mexico and southern California, uh, basically to build railroads from um, uh, Texas to San, uh, to San Diego. All of these events occurred when Mexico was under duress, often with civil war occurring in uh, Mexico City. So one of the things that's important to understand is that the border was formed under conflict and that the animosities we see today between the two nations have a long, long history uh, in formation. The border is the longest continuous uh, border in the world. 380 million people just pass north of this border each year, or at least last year. It is the most crossed border by humans in the world. So this is, this is the big kahuna, if you will, if I can use Orange County terminology, uh, for uh, borders. Um, the border region has a population of about 20 million formally the formal definition of a border by the United Nations is uh, 60 miles north and south of a geopolitical line. In reality, the border, Los Angeles, even up into San Francisco, San Antonio, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, um, Tucson, Phoenix, all of these areas, and then south, Monterey, all of these areas are actually the border territory. So in reality, we're talking about 100,000 to 120, I'm sorry, 100 million to about 120 million people really that are affected by the border. Um, and the border has, interestingly, this goes back to NAFTA and the Clinton presidency in, in that era, uh, has developed into the major industrial center for Mexico with multiple factories that employ about 1.6 million people. In remittances to, California, uh, to Mexico from immigrants that are in the United States is um, 33.5 million people, or 33.5 billion dollars. This year it's the largest uh, foreign exchange income for Mexico. It surpasses now their export of oil. So, for Mexico, the border is very, very important. An important thing also about the border is Washington, D.C. and Mexico City are very far away from the border. And often the border has been ignored until recently when it's become a political, if you will, tool for both countries, by the way. What are some of the challenges for the border population, and in particular those that, are, that have migrated over the border into the United States? And I say migrated because we have different categories. We have those that migrate for, for work and uh, to reunite with families. We have refugees. And honestly, there are some criminal elements moving uh, methamphetamine or other things over, very small minority. But, for the general population and the general uh, immigrant population that's come across, and by the way, the largest U.S. citizen population outside the United States is in Guadalajara, so there's a two-way immigration going constantly at the border. Anyway, environmental degradation is incredibly important. The border is a desert. Water is at, ri is at risk at all times. Pollution cannot be cleared easily. Particulate matter in the air causes severe problems with uh, pulmonary disease, particularly asthma in the population centers. Uh, food insecurity and shelter insecurity, these are things that we're, we're very familiar with right now. And uh, as was discussed already, there, the immigrants, particularly those that are undocumented, are subject to really undefined laws and actions and restrictions. Right now they're being metered, they can't even uh, you know, there's, not, there's no such thing as an appointment to be seen and things like that for immigration and all. Uh, monitoring infectious diseases is difficult because we work with two totally different public health systems. The local public health, uh, health officer system in the United States, the English system versus the Franco-Spanish system in Mexico where everything is centered in Mexico City. Acculturation is an issue and a challenge. It's led to uh, uh, obesity among um, uh, uh, immigrants, which then leads to chronic disease. 
Health communication and education has to be culturally appropriate and very difficult to do if you're coming from, like me, a very uh, uh, typical Anglo-Saxon, if you will, background. Ex uh, economic exploitation was just discussed. And incredibly important is spiritual uh, degradation. Without good spiritual health, public health is very difficult to uh, attain. One thing I've noticed in working in the El Paso sector is that over the ten, last 10 to 15 years, when I first was down in that area years and years ago, it was young men coming over, very healthy, very uh, you know, uh, uh, aggressive towards getting over the border, young women occasionally, now it's families, 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 families. Uh, and what does that do? And what are some of the advantages of migration? Well, these young families, we need in the United States that all of you someday will be as old and, and ugly as I am right now, and that you'll need somebody to be paying your Medicare and uh, to be paying your Social Security. That's what these young families can do, as was just brought up. Um, the uh, immigrant population, first uh, uh, immigrants, not even the first generation, well, the first uh, new immigrants, if you will, into the United States have a 71% estimated employment rate. They're highly, highly employed, uh, as opposed to the general population, which is less than 50%. The border allows for interface of um, international markets and health products. And I think many of you are aware of, of people that do uh, medical tourism moving back and forth across the border, either for expensive pharmaceuticals, dental care, and those types of things, moving north for MRIs and things like that that are difficult to com come by in, in, uh, under, uh, in the South. Um, there's an improved pool of healthcare workers when you in look at the immigrant populations that have come in the United States. Nursing home attendants, health, uh, home health attendants, those that are driving uh, vans to get people back and forth to their appointments, things like that. Our pool of healthcare workers is really being driven uh, into a, a much better state with immigrants that are coming in and seeking jobs uh, that are in the healthcare industry. There are low crime rates among those that come into the United States, as opposed to those that are, I guess, already here um, or being going on. One thing very important, and this is particularly true in Los Angeles, is reinvigorating declining communities. In the 1990s, um, when I was with the LA County Department of Health Services, we basically watched LA burn, and it was very disturbing. Civil unrest, uh, more than one, one uh, type of civil unrest, degradation of the inner city. As that occurred, as the inner city decayed, who came in and rebuilt the city, has reinvigorated the city, builds churches, has demanded good schools? It's the immigrants. South Central now is nowhere what it was in 1993 or 92. And then workers come in and they're newly skilled, uh, forklift drivers, construction workers, and also we have an influx of professionals. Uh, legal professionals, nursing professionals, medical professionals, and others, investment professionals that come in to the country and uh, add to the country as immigrants. So in essence, one thing that I try and teach in my class and my closing point is, is that immigration is very important. We talk about immigration in different uh, uh, textures, if you will. The true fact of the matter is, is that on the U.S.-Mexico border, from Monterey North, from San Francisco, San Antonio South, we're all really one community, and we really need to uh, uh, solve our problems and integrate our, our work, our cultures, uh, our benefits, address our, our uh, uh, challenges, and unfortunately, uh, it's discouraging now to see it as such a political uh, hot ball that's being kicked around by people. Uh, what more can I say? Thank you. Okay.